Но я думаю, можно читать. Да, да, да. И тут вопрос насчет презентации. Можно, да, получить? Да. да. Я потом вышлю. Да. Хорошо, спасибо. Можете продолжить? Окей. Uh -huh. okay. All right. Um, then next topic um, would be the history of CubeSat admissions, and um, yeah, starting from 2001 year until today. Um, a few words about major uh, events in the timeline of the CubeSat admissions. 1999, uh, the first publication of CubeSat standard was released. The first CubeSat was launched in 2003. In 2004, there was a code of conduct of space debris mitigation was uh, uh, like accepted, and this included this 25 years of orbital decay for uh, satellites. 2014, the first Dove satellite with the biggest constellation of CubeSats was launched. Uh, 2017, the, the launch of 104 CubeSats at one rocket at once uh, occurred. Um, so the real innovation was not only the standardization of the satellite, but in the separation system. So the container, which is qualified and flight proven uh, and can be installed in the launch vehicle um, has many other benefits besides like just uh, reducing these risks. Um, still, the approach is pretty effective, uh, but only until a certain size. This is um, why there are not so many cube cells bigger than 16 units. Um, in other words, um, the fact that there is a separation system, which is handling all the mechanical, electrical uh, vibration interfaces to the launch vehicle significantly reduces the risks for the small satellites in terms of this like interfaces match and uh, launch environment. Uh, and let's have a look on some of the pretty cool uh, CubeSats which has been have been launched before. So this is Xiai 4 satellite was built by University of Tokyo in Japan and launched in 2003 by Eurocat launcher. It was dedicated to pretty high orbit with, with 820 kilometers sun synchronous. Um, the basic, that was one of the like pretty much first CubeSats um, launched into space. The platform was based on all, like all the components were commercial in the shale. Uh, as for attitude control system, it used permanent magnets and hysteresis rods. Um, and it also used some CMOS uh, camera module for um, taking pictures of the Earth. The fun fact with a permanent magnet is that um, in the magnetic field of the Earth, it can, uh, the magnet can uh, orient the satellite without like really turning on and off the attitude control system. So it's a really uh, cost efficient way to orient the satellite in the position you want. Um, so the, the fun fact uh, about the satellite is, uh, even though it was launched in 2003, it's uh, already 17 years on orbit, yeah, like 14 plus years on orbit, and it's still operational. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, the camera module, uh, which is uh, which was installed in the in the satellite, like pretty small and pretty like pretty compact camera. Um, and these are the pictures taken um, taken with this camera. Yeah, like pretty <laughs> pretty low resolution, but uh, thinking about like 70 years back, that was uh, like the big success for such a small cubesat to make these pictures. Uh, the next uh, interesting uh, satellite is QuakeSat-1. It's built by Stanford University and operated by QuakeFinder LCC, and launched uh, also with the, the previous satellite in June 2003 to the same orbit. Um, as for the mission, it was single axis uh, search coil type magnetometer, like 
pretty interesting device to verify for detection of extremely low frequency waves for earthquakes. And that's basically where the name of the satellite comes from. Uh, so it cost of the satellite was like 1 million, um, pretty high cost if we look at that today. Uh, that was the first three new CubeSat with deployable solar panels and a scientific payload. Um, so it worked more than 11 months. Uh, it was pretty expensive to operate. Uh, that's basically uh, was the reason behind shutting down this uh, the mission. Um, if you look on the left, you can see um, some like uh, how the satellite uh, deployable structures were uh, installed uh, on the satellite. So that's uh, the body with the mounted solar panels. Um, so it had quite a large uh, area of so covered by solar cells. Um, this is the inner frame with hardware components and it was installed like, uh, like it, it is uh, supposed to be inside the body mounted. After that, there was antenna assembly for telecommunication and telecommands, um, which was uh, like installed on the boom. So if you can imagine this green uh, rectangle inside the satellite, so the antennas were already boomed, so they were a little bit further from the satellite body. Then there was another boom uh, extension with the magnetometer payload. Um, so in order to operate um, magnetometers properly, there should be no like magnetic uh, disturbances around this. So it's, most of the magnetometers which are used in CubeSats and, and the satellites are um, built on this kind of booms to uh, place them further away from structure and from some like noisy components as reaction wheels, for example. So that was uh, the reason behind this boom extension and uh, yeah, with magnetic payload. That's how the satellite looked um, like uh, in the real life. So that's the antenna, the satellite with solar panels, the boom and the magnetometer in the end. Uh, GeneSat-1 uh, was developed by NASA Ames Research Center, was launched in 2006 uh, by Minotaur rockets to 410 kilometers, 40 degrees inclination. The main mission goal was to uh, like, onboard micro laboratory that provides life supports for bacterium. Uh, so basically it had um, the compartment where uh, some bacteria lived um, with some um, specific environment inside. That was the first successful mission uh, which kind of combined uh, bus module and dedicated payloads. So they were like uh, uh, quite a tricky interconnection between them. Uh, so flight radio autonomous technology demonstration farm platform that became a platform for some other um, like solutions as Pharmasat, uh, Nano CLD and so on. That was um, the first CubeSat which was able to regulate internal like internal payload compartment temperature within like minus plus minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius, um, and the payload consisted of 12 well fluid plates uh, that used 12 custom optical units uh, and growth rate measurement. Basically, uh, so the bacteria inside this compartment had like their uh, very comfortable for their development uh, environment and their gro growth of the bacteria was uh, measured. Yes, here uh, there is one like, more representation of the satellite. Uh, it's like a three unit CubeSat with solar panels around uh, with uh, some tuna can uh, outside. The bus module occupied only like one unit of the satellite and the pilot module was uh, in the rest of the two units. Uh, here you can see the golden cover of this unit and this is uh, the unit without this cover. Uh, the next one is Delphi C3, was built by Delft University of Technology Netherlands. It was um, launched in 2008 by PSLV to 613 kilometers sun synchronous orbit. Uh, the point of this mission was to test uh, wireless sun sensors, a new type of thin 
film solar cells. Um, in this kind of small satellites, uh, sometimes it becomes tricky to place the harness and like, to de design the harness in a smart way that um, once satellite is integrated, uh, all the cables are uh, nicely placed and there's no collision and uh, there's no risk of cable being detached. Uh, that's why like some of the cast like uh, CubeSat developers thought towards making some sensors wireless and that was um, the f one of the first satellites to show the technology. First, uh, so this satellite was first university class set of Netherlands. Um, after the satellite uh, was launched and was functioning, uh, the students of this company, they decided to run, uh, to build the company out of that, which is still in the market, it's called ISIS. Uh, and now it's running the CubeSat shop. So basically it's an online shop where you can buy components uh, for the CubeSats. Um, many of the components of this satellite are successfully commercialized uh, and been developed. So that's uh, like another render of the satellite. Um, here we can see that it has like pretty tricky solar panel uh, design. This is built of this same film solar cells. Uh, it has like quite a lot of antennas. Um, yeah, it's an uh, interesting design. Uh, this is the autonomous wireless sun sensor board, uh, as it uh, requires no cables, uh, which means no power. It has it carries their own solar cell uh, to get some power. Um, with a mass of seventy five grams, it uh, occupies quite a lot of space for the sun sensor. So it's six to four to two millimeters. As for comparison, our sun sensors occupy like. Uh, one by two by uh, one point five millimeters uh, cube millimeters. Field of view was ninety to ninety, which is also kind of not the best quality uh, sun sensor. Uh, there are much better sun sensors in the market, but the fact that this was wireless was pretty cool. So it used a radio link uh, based on co commercial modules of, of nine hundred fifteen megahertz. Um, it carried two sensors on one board and as one failed, another one was working uh, and was functioning. So the mission was successful in the end. Um, so the miniaturized version of this module was under development, but I actually didn't see much of the um, sensors like that in the market due to uh, the fact that um, building the wireless network with every component carrying its own uh, solar cell is uh, actually more difficult than building the proper harness for the satellite. Uh, this is the BSAT uh, 1 and 2, the satellite developed by Technical University of Berlin. It was launched in 2013 on PSLV. Uh, so the, the, yeah, the first one launched in 2009 on PSLV and the second one launched on Soyuz in 2013 on sun synchronous orbit of 730 kilometers with a mass of one kilogram, the main mission was to demonstrate the technology developed at the university. So they, these were the first satellite to demonstrate active attitude control within the one unit um, like, um, form factor. Uh, for that special micro wheels developed uh, by the, like for this mission, um, were built by the Astra Astrafine company. Um, so they were like really small and I'm not sure, no, there, there's no picture, but they were occupying like 0 0.5 space of the satellite and the rest was for like onboard computer electrical power system. Um, yeah, that's, that's the picture of the satellite. Every side of the satellite was carrying solar panels. These are the two uh, Antennas, uh, sun sensors were placed around the solar panels. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. This is the next generation uh, called BSAT 4, was built um, in, and launched into 16 to 5 kilometers, 500 kilometers orbit. The main goal was also technology demonstration and 
there the major goal was to prove the concept of gps based orbit tracking uh, the satellite was based on some modifications of the previous uh, version of the vsat um, however there was like additional space like on the top here you can see the gps antenna so there was additional space to accommodate the gps uh, receiver built by German Aerospace Agency. A, a few words about Dove satellites. So uh, I named the Planet Labs company several times uh, earlier today. The first satellite was launched in 2013 by Soyuz to 550 kilometers sun synchronous. The main mission was to demonstrate the capabilities for the remote sensing. Um, so that was the, one of the first satellites, that, the first satellite launched by Planet. Um, that was the prototype of the next like flock constellation, which has been launched since then and has achieved like more than 400 satellites on orbit. Um, so the overall size of the satellite is occupied by three unit uh, camera and the telescope. This is the X band transmitter with antenna. Um, for the payload data link. Now, with this use of these cameras, it's possible to achieve five meters resolution, uh, like spectral resolution. Uh, satellite carries also like uh, deployable solar panels. And the tricky thing about the architecture of the satellite, as the over like all the size of the CubeSat is occupied by telescope, which is like cylindrical, all of the other components are located like around them. So they are not standard PC-104 style of PCBs. Uh, They're like really interesting oval size uh, design. It doesn't, yeah. Uh, in order to provide this flow constellation and in order to achieve this idea of daily revisit of single point of the earth, uh, it requires to build like a facility where several satellites can be produced per day. Um, yeah, so daily global coverage capability is the unique selling point of the company. Um, yeah, and here you can see like how many dose, uh, how many of these satellites uh, are getting ready for the next launch. Every satellite is around five, five kilograms and for active attitude control, it, the using flywheels, not direction wheels. Um, expand the link and UHF uplink are used for commanding the satellite and downloading the data. Uh, Lemur satellite um, built by Spire Global is the next interesting example of the CubeSat three unit form factor. It was launched in 2014 to 650 kilometers sun synchronous orbit. The primary goal was to demonstrate the technology. So that was the first satellite uh, launched by Spire Global. And like this platform became the basic for the, like, the, the whole constellation, even though other satellites were carrying different payloads. Uh, it's called Lemur because um, <laughs> the idea of the, behind the satellite that so it opens the solar panel as the lemurs are staying on the sun. Uh, pretty fun, fun fact. And uh, every satellite weighted like 4 kg, you had three axis active attitude and orbit determination control system. X-band was used for communication. So primary goal of this constellation is to track ships using ice signal. Um, this is... Um, the possible application of that is trade monitoring, asset tracking, CNR, illegal fishing, and everything like in maritime domain, privacy awareness. Uh, up to today, yeah, the uh, Spire has uh, grown the constellation more than to more than fifty satellites, and providing their service in this field. Um, more exciting uh, applications: uh, the NASA. Ice Cube, developed by NASA Goddard Space and Flight Center, was launched in April 2017 by Cygnus to 400 uh, kilometers orbit for technology demonstration, with primary goal to validate some millimeter wave radiometer for cloud ice observations. Um, 
yeah, so basically uh, what the monitoring. Um, this is the internal configuration of the of the satellite, so solar panels uh, deployables. Um, then the core sun sensors here, radiometer payload was accommodated on the side of the satellite. Um, the main stack uh, is located uh, like in the middle uh, with some like interface module, GPS receivers. Um, you can, we can see two UHF antennas, the radio module, electrical power systems, uh, the battery pack, and GPS antenna patch on the side. And total size mass was three kilograms with the size of the three U. As for uh, attitude control, flywheels were used, and here the, we the satellite didn't have high speed communication, but used the UHF uh, to downlink the data. Um, so basically, the satellite was built on the pumpkin, um, pumpkin based component. That's another company providing CubeSat components. Uh, while like some other components were purchased from like different vendors. Um, that's a good example of how um, the company is not building the platform by themselves, but uh, it buys different uh, components and just integrates the bus together. RainCube uh, is an awesome project uh, developed by NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory launched in 2018 for LEO mission. Uh, the main goal is to demonstrate the technology um, or KA band atmospheric radar for CubeSats in the space environment. So basically this is the huge KA band antenna. And um, yeah, the idea is to uh, use this antenna for atmospheric radar applications. Um, yeah, here here we have the satellite. Um, this is the the spot where antenna is located during the launch. Basically, it like uh, it's deployed like an umbrella once so on orbit. Sorry, you turned off your demonstration. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Just a second. That'll be fine right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all uh, right, so um, the antenna is deployed as an umbrella after the separation of the satellite. Uh, so it's just open, opens um, uh, right here. Uh, we can also see uh, several like star trackers, batteries uh, located here and huge solar panels for this antenna to, to be able to function. Um, as NASA is the one who is leading the CubeSat uh, technology uh, evolvement in the world, there are a couple of other pretty cool projects which have been launched. Uh, IroCube, for example, and uh, OCSD. There were two satellites, uh, and the one, like the third satellite, was launched um, recently to demonstrate optical communication between satellites. The first two IroCubes failed due to attitude control system imperfections. However, the third one uh, was already functioning and could uh, downlink quite a lot of data. Seaport is a mission to demonstrate in orbit rendezvous and proximity of um, two CubeSats. Um, basically, two CubeSats, first of all, shall uh, position themselves in the orbit so they can dock and then demonstrate uh, the docking mechanism. Um, I said this is the CubeSat with propulsion based on Hull technology. Um, while the satellite size, uh, as we, we have noticed in the statistics before, satellites and CubeSats are becoming bigger as the instrumentation grows and the people want, would like to launch more interesting and more advanced um, satellites on orbit it's for some of them it's already required to keep the station to be able to change the like attitude or to, to keep the orbit um, during the timeline so like uh, some of the propulsion technologies for example hull technology um is like really interesting in, uh, when we're talking about the cubesats uh pathfinder tdr that's the 6u cubesat model for like the big 
satellite bus, which can be uh, used for multiple technology validation missions at the same time. All right, so these were some exciting examples um, of CubeSats. Uh, and now I would like to dedicate the last part of the of my talk to some launch vehicles and um, uh, some rockets description. And uh, I'll start with deployers in general. So there are a couple advantages of using like deployers. Um, an orbit first is standardization. Um, this allows uh, to choose from different multiple deployers without changing satellite mechanical properties. Basically, all the deployers which are in the market, they follow the uh, QSAT design specification and it leaves the flexibility for, pay, for satellite providers um, to choose the best option in terms of deployment. Um, they are spring-based deployment mechanism is uh, yeah based on spring so um, it's smoothly like uh, and really reliably uh, so this prints like fundamental physical principle that contributes to easy and safe deployment uh, so there's no pyrotechnic it's just uh, spring-based different launch opportunities so the deployers can be used on all the launch vehicles which is providing pretty wide range of launch possibilities for customers. Um, the flight heritage includes that uh, like flight proven deployers are reliable and don't have to be modified. So after one time working on orbit, you can be sure that it's uh, like quite reliable. Safety uh, is the next uh, characteristic. Um, so the total enclosure of the CubeSat reduces safety concerns coming from the side to the launch provider. Here, what we've talked about was um, the mechanical vibrations uh, uh, make it, as the deployer dampens the mechanical vib vibrations, uh, it's much safer for the CubeSat to be launched um, using this uh, dampening interface. Uh, and of course, like it's less work, um, the amount of documentation which shall be provided to the launch provider is quite big with all the, uh, like meeting all these paper requirements is quite a big piece of work. So while choosing the um, deployers as an option to go to like uh, orbit, uh, it will just take most of this documentation away uh, and much less uh, head pain from that. Um, and here are some, let's talk a little bit about the rockets uh, and the launches. Um, the first one, uh, and the one we've had the most uh, experience with the Soyuz, with the main stage frigate. Um, it's uh, flying since uh, 1966 for quite a long time, and frigate stage is uh, since two th 2000. Um, it, yeah, it's like the basic payload masses to sun synchronous orbit can reach 4.8 tons. Uh, and if we're talking about LEO, it can reach up to eight tons. Um, it is quite cost effective uh, in terms of successful launch and possible orbits. It's also a pretty good choice. However, uh, it's not as frequent as uh, some satellite providers would dream about. The PSLV is an Indian uh, rocket developed by Indian Space Agency. It's uh, um, working since uh, 1993. It has much less um, payload capacity as compared to Soyuz, only 1.75 tons per sun synchronous orbit and 3.8 tons for LEO orbit. It's pretty cheap. Uh, which uh, brings to the backside of um, there were a couple of big launch failures. So successful launches, um, like we put two out of five grade here. Um, it cannot go to any possible oral orbit uh, and the launch frequency is quite low. However, that like the biggest satellite, uh, CubeSat, um, um, amount of cubes that was launched with this Indian rocket was like 104 satellites at the same time. Um, Bega is the 
European uh, orbit developed by IVO and Ariane Space. Uh, it's been um, in business since 2012. It can carry even less mass to the sun synchronous, only 1.45 tons and 2 tons to LEO. Um, it's got quite not cost efficient and it had like a lot of troubles with successful launches. Like there were quite a lot of um, launch failures, especially within last years. Um, the, there are several orbit, it, orbits it can uh, deliver the satellite to, however, the launch frequency is like absolutely low. Um, <clears throat> Falcon 9 um, is the, U, the US company, I think like, everybody knows about SpaceX, um, and it's um, launching since 2015. Uh, it can bring to low Earth orbit up to 22.5 tons, um, while the cost um, like is, is getting lower and lower, lower every year. So it's uh, quite cost efficient rocket. Um, um, there, there are many successful launches. So like we put out of two out of five, including the cost failures at the very beginning. But I think right now it's quite a reliable rocket. It, Cannot do as many possible orbits uh, like us, uh, like others can do, but it's absolutely beautiful in terms of launch frequency. That every year SpaceX is like I'm uh, launching more and more rockets, especially with the uh, technology of bringing the rocket stages back. Um, comparing to the existing and like big rockets, there are couple of other small launchers uh, which are coming which are already working so first one is the electron by rocket labs the new zealand company um it, they can bring in one up to 150 kilograms to sun synchronous orbit um so they had like already more than 10 launches as far as i remember and they were properly functioning. Nublen is the Blue Origin uh, development. Um, it's still in the development. It's a successor of New Shepard and uh, suborbital crew flights. Uh, news are coming, but uh, yeah, they're still in the test procedures right now. Firefly Alpha is the 400 kg US-based LEO orbit. The, Unique selling point of this rocket is that it has light carbon structure. Um, I mean, the development is a little bit paused. I think we'll see what will be in the future. And the Ripple Aerospace, um, uh, Norway based company. Um, the interesting fact about this rocket is that it has a canic start. So basically, you can bring the ship anywhere to the equator or to any other place and launch from there. Um, Talking about launchers, there are many more launchers, and I think in Europe, almost every country wants to develop their own launcher. Uh, however, it's, that's a tricky question. Like, there shall be several tens of hundreds of, hundreds of millions investment before the proper engine and the proper rocket is built. Um, and last topic I would like to address today is regarding space debris. Uh, as people become more and more aware of what's happening in the low Earth orbit and how many constellations are there, space debris mitigation was issued by United Nations in 2002. So these um, guidelines, they recommend that the satellites and like everything what is designed uh, shall be deorbited within 25 years after end of life. Um, however, this 25 years, if we're talking about uh, hundreds and hundreds of satellites launched by year, is quite not enough. CubeSats in orbits above 550 kilometers uh, have orbital life of more than 20 years in general. If we conduct like um, the simulation of decay, we'll see that it can be like much bigger. Um, so taking into account the amount of satellites launched uh, within the next 20 years, the orbit can become like really crowded. 
Um, so what are additional aspects to, here to think about? Uh, lack of the propulsion and propellant for mitigation maneuvers. Uh, that means that not every sub, not every CubeSat developed uh, carries the propulsion unit. Um, most missions do not require that. And short design time and long time without any control. Um, as um, some CubeSats are failing, um, some CubeSats just uh, like after the um, mission has been conducted, nobody take care, takes care of the satellites, which are not interesting anymore. Um, as a consequence, force deorbiting might become the mandatory in the near future, at least like space agencies um, are talking about that, um, especially in the European Space Agency, as they're pretty concerned about um, like space debris. That it might become the, become the requirement for the satellites to be launched to carry some additional instrumentation to be able to deorbit within like lifetime or even faster. Um, there, are, there are mechanisms to deorbit, which can be uh, integrated into small satellites. The first one is the drag. Um, this mechanism can have an impact only below certain height. So um, small CubeSat cross-section limits maximum orbit height. Um, this can be done like with a huge sails over the balloons, um, basically increasing the drag, um, the atmospheric drag satellite can decay faster. Electrodynamic tether um, can use the magnetic field as drag forces. Um, this can be done like basically on other, like on many other orbits. Uh, however, it's not as efficient as this drag sails. And propulsion is um, the most efficient mechanism for lowering the orbit. Um, it is used uh, to force reentry processes uh, by changing the orbits, like making the orbit lower. Um, low orbit maintained by constant propulsion uh, will also mitigate the failures uh, in the low, like in uh, bring it to fast deorbiting. Um, yes, uh, let's like review some of the deorbiting mechanisms a little bit more um, precise. So this is the called so-called ter CubeSat terminated tape. It's a small compact device which is placed on the side of the satellite. It's quite, quite lightweight. Um, and it yes, helps um, the satellite to deorbit uh, with this tethered mechanism. It only weighs 83 grams and it's also equipped with solar cells, which means it's self-sustainable. It doesn't need any like, connection to the satellite avionics. Um, balloons uh, is the next one. Uh, so they're inflated uh, by the command. Um, from the CubeSat as soon as it's time to deorbit. Um, so there are several developers of this kind of devices. They weight much more than uh, this uh, tethered devices. Uh, for example, this one is more than 150 grams. There are different diameters. Um, as for material, the balloon, a uh, silver aluminum oxide coated capton is just, uh, and it's impregnated with rigidizing resin. Um, so it's like quite weird to see this the, the satellite with this, uh, such a huge balloon yeah but like this kind of devices would really help to mitigate some orbiting some debris and uh, in the low earth orbit um and some propulsion modules uh, for example this one is developed by Aerojet rocket din uh, this is already the big device to be carried by the cubesat at 1.7 kilograms without fuel and 2.2 with fuel. Um, as for size, it occupies more than one unit, unit space um, and use like, the frequency which propulsion it can use. Um, the maneuver, um, which is like, to be done to the orbit the satellite is quite complicated and requires the advanced attitude control characteristics for the spacecraft. Um, and as we can see, this propulsion module cannot be accommodated in the small CubeSat already, um, which is the limiting factor for these types of deorbiting mechanisms. Um, and this one is actually my favorite uh, type, uh, the huge inflatable sail. 
to argument the drag force um, and this maybe solar pressure force as well to, to the orbit. Um, these types of sails have been already on the orbit. The technology radiance level is quite close to nine. And this one in particular is developed by SSTL uh, with a mass of two kg. It occupies like less than two units, um, but it can like once deployed, it's uh, taken 25 square meters, uh, which can like from 550 kilometers can take like two years for the satellite to the orbit. As for material, the 12, um, Micrometer capton membrane with like a luminized structure is used. And here, like here we can see uh, the sail um, during the test. Quite big. <laughs> and this is the, yeah, this is just a small satellite uh, which is uh, carrying this, this module. Uh, all right, uh, so that was pretty much it from my side. Do you have any questions? I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much. So here was some question about peapods. Mm -hmm. Rails, uh, so the rails for the CubeSats. Yes, so basically they have to be manufactured and designed by the satellite developer. However, um, while developing the CubeSat, it's uh, it's normally like normally people contact deployer providers uh, on the early stages, and uh, like deployer providers and launch providers can assist uh, with these requirements and can help designing the, like, the proper structures. So for example, at Excel launch, we do this kind of service. Yes, any other questions? And I have a question about how can we, like universities, can be involved with such kind of projects? So how could be uh, possible to sharing tasks? For example, making some uh, research or even for publications like starting jointly projects on some writing some articles. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, um, I'm not sure when she is presenting, but th there is a another lecturer, Yelena. She, like she is uh, more in charge of um, um, contacts and all the. Uh, collaborations so i think she is the best person to address this like i'm uh, more on the technical side yeah i mean like uh, from side of the researcher uh, what do you think could we be involved also or it's yeah. <laughs> i think for universities it's like uh, for aerospace related uh, or focused universities like cubesat field is the best uh, to start uh, um, doing some kind of research, yes. It's like, it's not as complicated as uh, traditional aerospace projects. It's uh, pretty easy and pretty cost effective. So yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other questions? So, okay, if there is no questions, Nurdanegad, do you want to say something? So we have specialists on space technologies who started already the master courses. Okay, I think some technical problems. Okay. So I would like to say very, very big thanks uh, for your time and for your uh, very uh, interesting presentations. And we will wait <laughs> for them, uh, <laughs> for your slides. Mm -hmm. And is it possible to put them on the websites, like for public? Um, like 
from my perspective, there's no problem. Uh, I will just need to consult with organizers of the school. Okay, okay. And if you'll share with us, I will just share with others because I have a list of uh, emails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And Thank you too. Good luck. Okay. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Rahmat Khan, my guest. Спасибо большое всем. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.